Hello, so today we've got a bit of a historical get ready with me in the later 18th century. I've got an event that I'm going to meeting some online friends in real life in a fun kind of historical setting and thought it might be a good idea to film the getting dressed, see how everything goes together and just sort of chatting about 18th century things. So without further ado, let's get started. So as you can see, we're starting out just with the plain shift on. This is kind of your base underlayer for a long time period in history. It helps protect your skin from the clothes, it helps keep you cool because you normally have it in linen, and it also helps protect your clothes from you know things like sweat and skin and perfumes and any other stuff you might have on your body that might stain or damage your clothes in one way or another. So that's what we've got on here. And it's a little bit adjustable at the neckline. You can, with this drawstring, there's a stri uh, tie, and you can just pull that in or out um, to adjust the neckline to fat fit your clothes. So I've got it here for the moment, but I might um, adjust it once we get the, the dress on. So I'm actually gonna start with putting on my stockings and my shoes, because it's a little bit easier to do before you've got the stays on. So, I mean, I've just got these, which are <laughs> some cheap white knee length um, socks, stockings, because that's what I have available, but I'm gonna get some nicer clocked ones at some point. So just put these on. And so likewise, my shoes aren't particularly historically accurate. These are actually just like my standard shoes at the moment. Um, partly because I also don't really have any great 18th century style shoes. I have some late like Regency style and onwards, but nothing 18th century style, which is partly a money thing, um, partly because I have slightly dodgy feet, um, so I find it really hard to find shoes that are comfortable for me. I haven't yet wanted to invest that kind of money in a pair of shoes that I don't even know if I'll be able to wear to events, let alone in my day-to-day -day life. But these will kind of do as like a lace-up um, thing for now. I definitely I mean, obviously I believe in this because <laughs> it's how I do my costuming, but you know, do what you can with what you've got and have fun. Like, I don't think we anyone should be out here gatekeeping because someone's clothes or materials or all their accessories aren't perfect. Um, of course, if you're in an educational reenactment, serious environment where it is important to have everything be super accurate, that does make sense. But especially for just like fun, costumed meetups and hangouts and things, judging people for stuff like that is just really not cool. Okay, so now we've got shoes and stockings on, it's time for the stays. Uh, so these are my stays, there. Oh, I haven't got my all. Oh, be right back. Didn't mean my all, I meant my bodkin, which I also forgot I have lost, so I'm gonna be using a hairpin to lace my stays up. So, there we go. <laughs> okay, so these are front lacing stays. Um, they lace in the back as well, but uh, which makes them a bit more adjustable. Um, I just made them like this because it meant that they were easier to put on and off. You can put back lacing ones on yourself. I've done it, loads of people do it. Um, so, you know, that's fine. And people have been able to have done it in the time, but I just thought this would be a bit easier. And I kind of like the look of it as well. Um, this will sort of work. So this will take a little bit of time to do. I may end up speeding up a bit for your own sake. Um, you can have them like sort of all laced up already and then but really loosely and then just tighten them but I found that really I prefer to just lace it anyway even if it does take a minute. I mean, it's normally quicker because you'd have a proper bodkin. So I tend to just do this to get them on and then adjust everything because like my boobs aren't really in the right place right now. Um, but just do this to kind of get it on me and then I can tighten it up or adjust it as I need. So actually I might do that now. So you kind of have to like position everything into the right place. <laughs> Um, and you can see how already the tops of the shift are kind of helping sort of keep the bosom in place as well. It's not just about the stays, but also the shift kind of 
acts as like the top half of your bra does in a way. And I actually think it's a bit tight, so I might just um, lace it and fix that once the stays are on properly because I want it to come a bit lower. There we go. Uh, so. so you can see that these are being spiral laced, which is different to kind of what people more commonly associate with um, corsets. Um, from the 19th century onwards, which are generally um, cross-laced. Cross-laced the term? I can't remember. Um, but it's like the classic corsetry, like crosses that you see going down, whereas, and that's done with like two um, sort of lengths going across, like crisscrossing across each other, a bit like with lip, uh, shoelaces. Um, whereas this, you can see, is a single piece of lacing that zigzags across the stays and it's like a spiral if you were to sort of open it out it'd be spiraling around the holes um, i mean i'm actually not doing this properly either because it's meant to be under and over but uh, i like doing it where it goes over and under under yeah what am i doing i don't know I mean, to be honest, so long as your stays are on, it's fine. Again, I'm just going for a fun meet up with people, so it doesn't really matter, and also these aren't gonna be visible. So, really doesn't bother me that much. Okay. So we're laced in. I tend to just sort of leave this because um, there's not much tension at the bottom of my stays generally. So, so I'm just going to kind of adjust things um, to get them all in the right place. Um, I hope YouTube isn't going to hate me for this. Um, my shoulder straps are actually a, a bit loose these days um, and I should tighten them but I always find it so hard to do. Um, I should do it before I put the stays on really, but yeah, anyway, so I'm going to kind of leave it as it is for now just because I can't really be bothered. Um, I find with the stays, like, doing them a bit tighter doesn't actually make that much difference to how it makes you look. I mean, they're not actually, you know, 18th century stays, although there is an idealisation of, you know, having a neat waist, a small waist, um, just kind of like there is today in sort of discussions of beauty, beautiful women, things like that. Stays aren't, like from a sort of engineering perspective, don't really make you have a tiny waist, they don't, not really designed to. Um, they're designed to give you this sort of like straight sides, sort of cone shape. I mean, I could come in more at the waist here, I think if I just tightened it up at the back, um, which isn't me, that's actually not me coming in more, that's just closing the space because there's like a huge gap in here. But to be honest, I quite like where I am a bit looser, just because and um, it looks fine still so the main thing I think I find that's important to get right is actually this top bit around the bust partly for the silhouette but also partly for comfort so your breasts are actually supported how you need them to be um, which will make wearing everything else just so much more comfortable because it's all sitting in the right place rather than trying to squish around and I think that's kind of a big misconception around things like stays and corsets in these periods and, and for people who wear them today as well um, that you know you're not just doing it's not just about vanity and getting the correct shape although that is part of it there is also a big element of yeah of comfort so that your clothes fit you properly and your body is you know you feel like it's sort of sitting in the right place and so for different people that does mean different things and obviously that means different things in different time periods as well but I've been thinking a lot recently about um, ideas of comfort and the 18th century in particular and that it's not just about, you know, how loosely you can move. I mean, lots of people feel more comfortable today wearing a bra than they don't because their breasts, you know, they feel like they need the support for whatever reason. I don't know if that's kind of a mental or an actual physical um, thing. Um, anyway, yeah, I've said that too many times. So stays are on as we can see and you can kind of see how, like I said, the shift is helping to contain the top of the breasts um, and keep everything nicely in place. So next up, I'm actually going to do my hair 
because I find it a bit easier whilst I've still got relatively free arms. Although my dress actually does give me quite good arm movement. So we'll be doing hair next. So I've just got, I've got my hair is in its like, you know, natural state pretty much. Um, a little bit not clean, which actually kind of helps. And I'm going for a sort of smart but working lower middle class sort of a look. So I'm not going to be doing some big um, sort of fashion hairstyle. Um, so we're kind of talking sort of 1780s for the style that I'm going for. And around that time for the fashionable hairstyles, you sort of have the 70s where you get the classic tall hair that is famously associated with the 18th century. But then moving into the 80s, it goes into more of a sort of, the volume moves sideways. So it flattens out on the top and kind of becomes more of like a poof that kind of mushrooms out to the sides. And sort of it's often quite frizzed and like these tiny frizzy little curls. Um, I really do love it and I think it looks great, but I don't really want the effort of having to do that and making sure it all stays in place throughout the day. And I sort of like the idea of not just going for like the high fashion look. So we're kind of going to go for a bit of a basic 18th century-ish style that can kind of work across the period, I think. I mean, I, this isn't like, this whole look that I'm doing today, um, this whole getting ready with me isn't about being totally historically accurate, but being able to put together something that looks sort of right for the period and is fun and easy and fairly comfortable to be in and to be wearing all day long. So let's go ahead. I mean, pretty much all I want to do is create some volume at the top of the front, which will just add a nice bit of shape. And then I'm just gonna be kind of bunching all the hair up in the back into probably like a sort of bun-ish thing. So I'm just gonna section off some front bits for that. So that will kind of be doing something a, a bit like this. Um, <laughs> I'm obviously not a hair influencer anyway and then just gather this up in the back for now to get it out of the way god i've got so much hair okay so let's kind of get them all coming in together get the little flyaways i think i might have a bit much here but we'll see so we've got this little um, like hair wrap puff thing I'm going to use to help keep the volume in place. It's one of those donuts that I've just cut um, to make it long. But you can use anything. They probably you know you would have used like bits of your own hair, even like bits of like cork and things like that. Um, really, pretty much anything <laughs> that is going to just help provide. Or you can just do back hipping. Um, I just again want it to last the day. So I might just back home. A little bit. And pin this on behind it. Yeah. Oh, where's it gone? <laughs> so I'm going to pin that on to the top of my head. Again, like I said, not going for like, you know, totally original practice here, <laughs> although it's the kind of thing I would have been doing, just obviously with different materials at the time. So it's actually looking a bit Edwardian, which is not really what I want, but that's fine. And I just want to like arrange the hair so that it's covering the wrap completely, which it kind of doesn't want to on this side. Not quite sure why. Just not got quite enough hair there, I suppose. Anyway, so then... Oh, okay, I'm gonna come back and fit. Probably I haven't backcombed it enough. Um, to create, like, a nest. So like I said, this period was more about the wide, but because we're going for something not high fashion-y, you're sort of probably looking at something a bit more, not out of date, but just not kind of super on the pulse of the trends. I'm not, not crazy about 
how that's gone, but it'll be fine. Um, so I'll just get a bit of blade as well, just to kind of smooth it and hold everything in place. This rat is poking out annoyingly, but that'll do. Um, and then I'm gonna take down this back bit. And like I said, literally just, and what I'm actually thinking about while I'm doing this, because it's all gonna be under the cap, but I wanna create a decent-ish bit of base height for my hat later. Uh, so I'll just pin that in like so. And there's a ton of resources, YouTube and blogs and stuff with like much better 18th century hair styling, uh, proper tutorials and advice. This obviously is just me kind of chucking it up for something that will work for today. I think it's a little bit high at the front really for what I wanted, but it's fine. So that is the hair up. Yeah, I think I'm actually not going today, I'm going tomorrow. I'm just filming this today. Um, <laughs> look really at the Um <laughs> Yeah, it's not perfect, but it will do. So our next thing to go on as part of the hairstyling is the little cap, which I've made just the other day. And this is from the American Duchess book. Um, makes me look a bit like one of those weird lizardy things with the like wah, you know <laughs> but it's mostly going to be under my hat so i'm not too worried about that um so i'm just going to kind of get that all in the right place and then actually use pins like sewing pin dress pins not hair pins to pin it and just catching like a little bit of hair and then coming back up through it's a bit of a weird one actually, not really something I'm used to doing. And then this back bit, there's a little channel with a drawstring. And I just pull that to fit it to the back of my head nicely. So I think I might have just knotted it, but there we go. So that is on my head. I could probably pin it at the sides as well just to stop this flapping forwards and so caps like you really would have probably pretty much always worn a cap especially as an working for a working person um no i don't like what that's done but i have to do it's gonna be going under my hat anyway um so yeah you would have pretty much always worn a cap out and about um and at home as well or in company of any kind. It was just sort of a decency thing, um, a neat and tidy thing. And I think it's very interesting because it's been so common for, you know, most of history. You know, covering your head was a, a sort of a formality thing, um, a decency thing when you're out in public and around other people, um, and never something that, you know, was kind of a non-issue, everyone just did it. And it's only very recently, until kind of the middle of the 20th century, that wearing hats out of the house um, has stopped becoming kind of standard polite practice. I mean, obviously people still wear hats um, for fashion reasons or to protect from the sun or to keep warm in the winter, but it's not a sort of, you know, I must do this in order to, to be properly dressed and to be properly presentable, to be outside. Um, but wearing caps and hats has been, I think for a very long time. Okay, so our cap is on, our hair is in, it's all, you know, holding its place. Um, although it feels like it's precarious, but I don't think it is. Okay, so next up I will be getting back up and putting a couple of the underpinnings on and then we'll be getting on with the main dress. So first up we've got this little skirt, um, petticoat I should say, sorry, um, which is basically like a modesty petticoat. Um, it's the only time I've seen people referencing, not original stuff referencing, um, but it's just something you can wear as a additional little layer, it can add some extra poofiness, um, it you know, just works like a, a normal petticoat 
but also can um, give you some extra warmth if you need it, not that I do for tomorrow. Uh, and and yes, yeah, serves as a modesty layer, but as you can kind of possibly see, it's actually barely longer than my shift. So to be honest, I don't think I'm gonna wear it tomorrow because it's gonna be really warm. Um, Cause yeah, look. Oh, you can't actually see the hem. It's about this much longer than my shift anyway. If you had a short shift, it might be nice. Um, as a way just to keep your legs a bit more covered up. So, now we're getting on to our other underpinnings for the shape, creating the shape of the garment. So yeah, now we're getting on to our other underpinnings, which are gonna create the shape that we need for our dress. So again, we're talking kind of 1780s, so in the sort of middle of the century, uh, the style is very much the volume at the sides, which is where you get the big wide panniers, pocket hoops come in a little bit later, and that's what goes under a robe à la française, or sorry, a sack gown, which is the period term for it. Uh, but then as you move forward into the later part of the 18th century, that volume starts to shift more towards the back, and so we get this, which is a false rump. There's lots of different versions of these. Um, they create slightly different shapes. Um, this one had a little extra skirt thing behind it, which honestly, I don't really know what the purpose is of that. And that just ties on and can be stuffed with like pretty much anything. I mean, probably would have been things like feathers, maybe cork. Um, I just used fabric scraps for it and I really wouldn't be surprised if there were people in the time who did something similar who just, you know, had some old rags lying around, although they might have been using those more for cleaning. Um, but anyway, so that's that. You can't really see any in the camera, but there we go. And then on top of that, we have our pockets, which I also just made really recently for this event because I haven't really had any events until now, so I didn't need pockets. And these just tie on around your waist. I think I'm gonna put mine on this way around. I kind of deliberately made them off center so that they could be a little bit kilted towards the back or a little bit kilted towards the front, depending on what I was wearing them with. But I think that these would be a bit better going towards the front, although I'm not totally sure. But I'll put them on the front for now as a test and then if I don't like that I can move them tomorrow and so these are as you can probably have told they're a super simple shape like kind of big elephant ears really um, and you and big and you can fit loads in them so that is going to be really good for wandering around tomorrow so we've now reached the time for putting on the actual dress, which actually doesn't start with the dress, it starts with the petticoat, which is this one. So I'm just gonna get that all straightened out. And this, I haven't kind of finished off the inside of it, so it's um, kind of molting everywhere, as you can see. But, uh, oops. Just stick my way into that. So these fasten 18th century petticoats in, I think, what is a genius way. Because you tie the front and then you tie the back. And it helps make them really adjustable because there can be more or less overlap then at the sides. Whereas if they just tied to each other at the sides, they're kind of fixed in with the size there. Um, unless you want to have a big gap, which we obviously don't want. So I'll just get all that kind of sitting on top of itself nicely and kind of in the right place. Um, and it's a shame I haven't really got the space to do like a full length thing, um, but I will share some pictures of the whole shebang. Yeah, so that is on. And then also you can see where they tied up. You've got these holes in the side through which oh, I can perfectly reach my pockets. Which is absolutely great so you can kind of might be able to see you've got this slit and the skirt and then this slit in the pocket and then i'm in to my pocket and i can put so much in there and you can barely even notice it i mean actually i sort of wish i'd made my pockets a lot longer um 
because you wouldn't be able to tell, and they, I could reach a bit further down, but that's fine. I can always make more. So, well, not lastly, but lastly for now, <laughs> we've got a lot of accessories to come, but finally we have reached the gown, the dress, the overdress. Um, so this is a 17, whoop, start that again. This is 1780s Italian gown. I, again, I don't think a period term, I don't actually know what it would have been called in the time, maybe an Italian gown. Um, from the American Duchess book. Now, you can kind of see, I've obviously not shut it up yet, but you can kind of see how my shift is peeking through a bit. And I'm just debating whether to adjust it first or afterwards. I think I might adjust it now to try give it a bit more space so that it's not going to peek out. I mean, it's not the end of the world, partly because I'm also going to wear a neckerchief over my neck anyway. So just getting that all in the right place. And then what happens is this pins shut down the centre front, which sometimes I find super easy to do and sometimes can be a little bit of a pain. And I think it just depends partly on the fit of the garment. You know, if you've changed size a little bit or if you've not laced your, laced your stays quite the same way. Um, I'm probably just on practice too, because I'm not amazing at it. I've not had that much practice. <laughs> which are called a tucker, these ruffles around the neck, which are actually kind of fairly loosely basted on and can be removed, would have been removed for things like laundering um, or just to change up the look of the clothes. But this front one's getting in my way, I can't see what I'm doing very well. see my pockets are still going to be accessible because this just slightly comes over where the slit is so I can still just slide my hand back again to my pocket below. So I've got a few bits more to go just to really complete the look. So because it is going to be hot and also just kind of for my own comfort I want to have a neckerchief on that is going to kind of cover this bit of my exposed chest, um, keep the sun off to be honest more than anything else. Plus we got a great tip from someone in the group who said especially if it's linen it's really great to soak it in water beforehand and then um, it keeps you cool for like three hours she was saying so I'm definitely going to be doing that. I'm not really used to wearing the neckerchief so I don't totally know how I want to tie it. It's kind of hanging a bit. Not how I want it to water um, <laughs> on the day to keep me cool. So with negatives like this, they would have them in white, kind of like this one. Also lots of different colours, exciting new fabrics and prints and things. Um, and you can kind of see it's like quite a good way of mixing up your look, changing things up. Um, so yeah, there we go. That's that. I whipped up a hat. 
So this hat I made literally from a charity shop hat that I just sort of cut up, reshaped and re-trimmed. Um, I don't think it's 100% historical because though you did have black flat hats like this, they generally, if they were black rather than sort of a natural straw colour, they would be covered in silk rather than being natural straw and generally black hats do seem to have been trimmed in black as well rather than contrasting colours. But this is what they had at the trash shop and this was the ribbon I had in my stash. So this is what I've got for now. So with the hat, just going to put it on like so and then grab. So I've got my hat on and I've grabbed this nice big long hat pin and I'm just gonna wiggle it in as best I can. Get that in, go through my hair, kind of weave it around a bit, try not to stab myself in the skull, and pop up somewhere over here. Oh, it's not the sharpest. So it looks kind of cute in the back there. And she holds the hat on pretty well, and then I can also just, so you can see what I meant about the cap being pretty much covered up. And just tie this onto the back of the head for a bit of extra security. And I guess a huge neck bow. <laughs> So yeah, it's kind of an interesting angle, I think, for uh, compared to sort of modern hats. It leans down over the eyes quite a lot, which I do feel, find a little odd looking, um, to be honest, when I'm looking at it. But it's going to be really great as sun protection. It's going to keep the sun off my eyes, keep the glare out of my eyes, because I can actually, I, can, I mean, I can see it in my eyes, this kind of quite far back. So it should do a pretty good job. It looks, you can actually... <laughs> as I am now, I feel like you can really see the influence of 18th century stuff on kind of like Dior, New Look, 1950s styles coming in, because you have got this, you know, big voluminous skirts and a big hat balancing it all out and quite a sort of pronounced bust shape as well. So yeah, this is my look all put together. I'm really excited for this event um, tomorrow. Uh, like I said, it's kind of the first thing that I've had the opportunity to go to since the pandemic um, and since I've been kind of getting into historical costuming as well I've mostly been focused on the making side of things rather than the actual getting dressed up and hanging out with people side of things so it'll be really nice to meet some people who are into it and some online friends and um, yeah I'm super excited I hope that this little get ready with me was fun I haven't got any jewellery on um, I'm probably just gonna wear a little black ribbon I think around my neck and maybe no earrings I'm not sure yet um, but yeah, thanks for joining in and see you again soon! Hello! 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 It's coming! <laughs>